welcome to our show. I'm Dr. Len Saputo. The topic we're going to be discussing today is what happened and what do we face in Fukushima. Remember back on March 11th when everything went bad? We had the tsunami and the, and the earthquake and, and there were these terrible things that happened in Japan. There were problems with nuclear reactors. And, and for about a month that was hot in the news and then all of a sudden things happened, didn't they, Harry? Things changed. Uh, uh, it was uh, interesting to watch. Them, interesting yes. to watch. And we're going to explore some of the things that maybe you didn't hear about, maybe you maybe you did. And we have with us uh, Harry Jabs, who is a uh, nuclear physicist who trained at Texas A&M and also has a diploma in physics from the University of Hamburg in Germany. So Harry, tell us a little bit more about your experience in nuclear physics and what qualifies you to be an expert in this particular topic. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me, Len. It's, it's an honor. Uh, I was educated in uh, physics in Germany. I got a degree there in um, uh, X-ray physics in a synchrotron radiation lab. <clears throat> and uh, then I got another degree in nuclear physics from Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I want to note that in both uh, laboratories um, uh, we worked uh, with radiation and um, as a matter of policy we were uh, required to take uh, ongoing educational courses in uh, the damage of uh, radiation. That and radiation you've been experiencing this now for how many years since then? Uh, well, I worked about uh, five years in the German uh, uh, nuclear uh, in the German uh, radiation lab, and about mm -hmm. seven years at uh, in Texas A and M uh, with nuclear radiation. Okay, so you're a qualified expert, in my opinion. I, I want to thank you for being willing to join us for this really this exposure. Well, you know, what, back in March 11th, uh, there was all this talk about the potential damage of radiation because of the nuclear plants that were in the northern part of Japan, up in Fukushima. And it took them a long time to disclose information. And yet we know that when you have a, a disaster like what happened there, that things happen quickly. And people know the answer about whether there's a meltdown or not very quickly. How does one determine, and what are the, what are the things that you need to know about meltdown? What's the timing of it? And what's involved uh, with a meltdown? Okay, I will give you uh, uh, my best estimate, um, which is only derived from um, uh, the news that is available to everybody and uh, with my background that I have in, uh, in nuclear physics and uh -huh. uh, in, in technology. <clears throat> I would say that um, well, first, uh, I would have to briefly explain how a nuclear reactor works. Most of you understand that already, but uh, just to put a few numbers on it. Okay. Uh, your typical nuclear reactor power plant uh, has a power output of between 500 megawatts to a little over a gigawatt. And uh, What would that power? Would that power the state of California? Oh, uh, no, 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 no. What uh, would that power? Um, a big city like San Francisco? Uh, maybe. Okay. Maybe. Yes, so now yes. we got some relative idea of how much energy is there. Yes. Okay. Uh, now this power comes solely from uh, the decaying process of uh, the nuclear material inside. Okay. That's what fuel it. Okay. So a nuclear reactor is basically a, a water boiler. That's what it is. Okay. And the nuclear de decay processes, uh, they generate the heat and the heat boils water and the boiling water turns, uh, turns to steam. Um, and that is driving the turbines, which then in turn make electricity. Now, um, the fuel um, uh, that fissions and produces the energy is in the form of fuel rods. You've heard that mm -hmm. uh, term before. Mm -hmm. These rods um, are about um, um, half an inch uh, thick, and they are in, in a casing of uh, zirconium to hold them in place. Now. Uh, this arrangement is done because you want to have moderator rods uh, that you shove between those fuel rods to control the rate of the decay. And that's how you uh, control the rate of the power that's being generated. So you, you regulate the temperature that way? No, the temperature is actually kept relatively constant, okay. but uh, the rate of energy being produced. So while the temperature is kept relatively constant, um, more power from the nuclear process would evaporate more water and thereby create more steam, but still at pretty much the same temperature. Okay, so it's the water then that's used to control the temperature and to keep it from overheating? The water is there to 
take the heat away uh -huh. from the nuclear core, which produces uh, the energy. Okay, so if we go back then to Fukushima when the tsunami hit and we lost the power to those plants, uh, how long would it take for a meltdown to occur in the absence of power? Well, that's why I alluded uh, to my introductory um, uh -huh. uh, um, uh, remarks. Uh -huh. What happens when there's a situation like this? Then uh, the normal procedure is that the reactor will be shut down. But that's a so-called hot shutdown mm -hmm. uh, versus a cold shutdown, which I believe is when the fuel is completely removed for refueling, for okay. example. Okay. So the hot shutdown uh, happens within seconds or no longer than a minute. It takes no longer than a minute. And what it means is that the control rods are being pushed into the reactor core uh, to... Um, bring the nuclear reactions to a minimum. Mm -hmm. You do not stop them because it still continues inside the fuel rods. But uh, you absorb uh, the neutrons which are driving this process as much as possible with the moderator rods which are between the fuel rods. Okay. So uh, the most important thing to know is when you shut a reactor down, so to speak, you do not end up with zero megawatts. You end up with, um, I would say, 10% uh -huh. of the of the power. So there's still a lot of power and heat coming yes, out. Yes, it, it is. So take the, a small reactor, 500 megawatts, and you shut it down. Then I would expect that even in a shutdown mode, the reactor still produces 50 megawatts, which is a tremendous amount of power. Mm -hmm. Now also consider that the reactor itself is really not all that big. It's, it's the core is the size of uh, maybe somebody's living room. Mm -hmm. So if you have now 50 megawatts of heat being generated in a volume this size, then uh, you can already imagine that it will not take very long before you have a situation there, before you get overheating. Now, as long as there is still liquid water, um, the temperature cannot rise above 100 degrees. Uh, actually, that's not true. The, it's, it's a little bit more, but not much more because okay. it's under... under um, uh, so getting water to cool is absolutely critical. Absolutely. And in the absence of water, how long does it take for a disaster to occur? Well, let me put it this way. In the, abs the, the water needs to be constantly recirculated. Right for two purposes. First of all, you want to transport the, the heat away because that's your energy that you want to use. But more importantly, you need to cool the, the core. If the if this circulation stops for whatever reason, then uh, the, uh, the, the 50 megawatts of energy will soon boil all the water off. And as soon as the water is being boiled off and the level of the water uh, drops, uh, and exposes the fuel rods, that's when the fuel rods are left to themselves and will uh, overheat and start to melt. And that is uh, first a partial meltdown. And then when all the water is gone, then you're probably looking at a total meltdown. How long does that take if you don't have water? Given the numbers that I just threw out, and let's say they are at least uh, uh, correct in the ballpark, I would give it just a few hours. So we knew on that first day what had happened. At least somebody did. It would be hard to imagine that a nuclear physicist with your background uh, wouldn't be aware of what you just said. I mean, it would be almost, it would be ridiculous to think they didn't know that information. And that yet it never came out. So I'm not asking you to accuse them of anything. But what I'm saying is, based on the science you know, within three hours, a meltdown would occur if there's no water. That's what I would expect, uh, and I, f I was really puzzled when weeks later people were still talking of saying, oh, um, uh, we want to check if the temperature uh, of the water has not reached too high levels, mm -hmm. when I thought that after a few hours there was probably no water left anymore. But that's just a, uh, a, a speculation on my part, of course. Okay, I well, let's... Know that. Okay. Now, there are certain protective mechanisms that these facilities have, sort of like a fail-safe system, yes. like stage one through three or four or five, yes, whatever yes, there is. Yes. Can you briefly tell us what those stages involve? Well, first of all, a nuclear reactor, um, uh, the, the engineers understand that you're dealing with a very dangerous um, uh, machine, and there have to be several layers of safety involved. Uh -huh. 
And uh, especially in Japan, uh, where the reactors are built on, on shaky ground, literally. Right. Um, and uh, close to the coast where uh, tsunamis are uh, well known. Uh, well known. Uh, they uh, and of course we know that Japan uh, Japanese um, are very technologically evolved. So they uh, will have. I would expect that they have excellent safety mechanisms. So, what kinds of safety mechanisms do, would you expect a nuclear plant like that to have? From what I heard, uh, is the first is once the main pumps fail for whatever reason, then um, diesel pumps kick in or diesel generators uh-huh. um, kick in to to continue the pumping. So that's the first backup. That's the first backup. Then, from what I understand, there's a second layer of backup. If that fails, that uh, will not recirculate the um, uh, the water through the core, but it will. Uh, provide enough cooling so that a meltdown will um, be uh, delayed anyway. will be either delayed or or, or uh, um, uh, avoided. Avoided, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I believe there are even more um, safety levels. Um, uh-huh. So what what do they involve? So we've got two systems here so far. Now there's a third possibility. Well, in order for these systems to work, you have to have electrical power because everything uh, works with uh, with electrical or diesel power. Uh So you have to make sure that you have enough diesel all the time, that the diesel can get to the generators, that the generators are running. Uh Um, They, of course, have to be above uh, water, Uh Um, at least the intake has to be. Uh, You have to make sure that any uh, of the electrical control instruments have power, Uh and that's where the battery backup came in. They also had a battery backup, from what I hear. But the battery backup uh, did not drive the pumps. It's not enough power to drive the pumps. The battery backup only powered uh, the instrumentation, to the monitoring instrumentation and the control instrumentation, okay. from what I gather. All right. Are there uh, any other backups besides what you've mentioned that you uh, could imagine they might have had? Well, if I would design a reactor like that, I would probably put 10 layers of, of, of safety in there uh-huh. because uh, I do not want to get the blemish uh, of uh, dealing with um, uh, an unsafe technology. Do you know if the if the systems that we have in this country, in the United States, have a backup system that has as many levels as you suge- suggested? I I I'm almost well I'm I'm almost I'm sure that there there are uh, backup uh, levels. You, you have to have those. Um, uh-huh. So what would it take for all those backup levels to fail? Well, uh, nothing is 100% uh, safe or 100% sure. But so it's a you, little surprising to see that everything failed and this thing melted down? Well, not only that, but you are dealing with uh, six reactors who had problems, mm. and three of them actually exploded. And wow. uh, that, uh, in light of all of these safety mechanisms, so that took me personally a little bit by surprise. Okay. So when there's an explosion in, in reactors like this, what what's exploding and what does it do? Well, we are being told that it was a hydrogen explosion, uh-huh. and um, the rationale behind that is that you have an overheated um, uh, reactor core that boils off water and it gets so hot that uh, the water actually splits into hydrogen and oxygen, uh-huh. and then it collects. These gases collect at the top of the vessel, and then at some point they get ignited, and then we get this explosion. Is that realistic? I. I had to take their word for it, but I have to tell you, when I looked at the explosions uh, that they showed uh, of Fukushima, to me it looked like a low-grade nuclear explosion. What makes you think that? Because the speed at which uh, the shock wave uh, propagated, I could approximately estimate the size of, um, or the speed of the shock wave by looking at the size of the building from Mm -hmm. the video and compare it uh, to how fast the uh, shockwave propagated. And while I have not done an in-depth uh, analysis, it looks to me as if it's at least going uh, with, uh, with the speed of sound. So you're looking at a nuclear explosion? Is that possible? 